proceed with our program and I, our guest speaker today is a recognized authority on our Native American heritage, specifically the Cherokee Indian Nation. She's a registered member of that tribe as I am and who knows we may even be related. Uh, good chance of that. She will tell about her journey to her family roots and I think you will all agree her presentation is amazingly original. Please welcome Juge, ooh, I don't know how you pronounce you you pronounce it for us, will you? Jugeo. and her um, that's her pseudonym, um, and you're going to be Nanny uh, a famous ancestor, A.K.A. Anita Duncan Adams. Welcome, Anita. I've given one of my descendants, Anita Duncan Adams, permission to appear as me. Nanyahi, Nancy Ward, the Jigayu. There was a commotion going on in the village. Something was happening. I went over there and a white woman was bound to a stake with kindling at her feet and they were ready to put a torch to it and burn this woman alive. I marched in, I released her bounds and I said, as long as I am Jigayu, there will be no women burned at the stake. My name is Nanyihi, Nancy Ward. I'm full blood. My great grandfather was Moitoy of Teleco, Supreme Chief from 1730 to 1760. I was born in 1738. My mother was Tame Doe of the Wolf Clan, and my father was a Delaware Indian chief. I married the noted war leader Kingfisher of the Deer Clan. I was at his side in 1755 when our village was attacked by Marauding Creek Indians. I hid behind a log, chewed the bullets to make them more lethal for my husband. When he fell mortally wounded, I grabbed his musket, fought like a warrior throughout the skirmish, and rallied our Cherokee warriors to an overwhelming victory. I am just one woman, just one. But we are given powers from our great creator we always have a choice. When faced 
was defending myself and my village so we would not all perish, I fought. I was awarded the coveted position of Jigeu. Due to, they say, my glorious, valorous merit. And by common consent, I became Chigeu, the beloved woman of the Cherokee. I was 17 years old. This is a lifetime distinction that carried with it the right to speak, to vote, and act in all the peace and war councils of the tribe. It also vested me with the supreme pardoning power of the tribe, the prerogative that was given to no other, not even the powerful war chief. By the wave of a swan's wing, I could make irrevocable decisions. Our Cherokee culture believed that the supreme beings often spoke to a people through a beloved woman and she was given absolutely power a question of what to do with the prisoners taken in war a power exclusive to Jigeu I did not hesitate to use my power I was given and rescued the woman that day a month before I had walked into the village to see what commotion was going on. War chiefs dragging canoe, Abraham and Pavan, planned to attack the western settlements of the British. On July 20th, 1776, Chief Abraham marched to attack Fort Watuga in eastern Tennessee. And on the way came upon a man and a woman They killed the man and injured the woman badly and captured her. The woman was Mrs. William Bean, wife of Captain William Bean, Jr. They were on their way to the fort for protection because the British were coming. So after her brother was killed and she was wounded, they took her captive, brought her to the village, and they condemned her to be born, burned at the stake. But when I walked into the village that day and cut her loose, I took her to my home to care for her and nursed her back to health from the injuries she suffered when she was captured. I told our tribe that with her instructions we could learn the making of butter and cheese that would sustain us during the times when hunting and fishing weren't so good. And I also advised them that the Patriots, great, great Colonel Washington, General George Washington, was the great chief of the Continental Army and Mrs. Bean's husband was one of the powerful war chiefs. And it was in our best interest to release her. Didn't want, I didn't want the Continental Army coming into our village. <laughs> so I cared for her, and when it was safe, I had my, hus my brother Tuskatihi and uh, my son Huskatihi to take her to her husband and release her. Not only was her husband a great captain, he was the first permanent settler in Tennessee. And he was also Scottish, of Scottish descent. And the Scots are known as fierce warriors. Later, under my protection, Mrs. Bean, Lydia, and I became friends. We had a symbiotic relationship, learned from each other, and she taught me and the other women in our tribe loom weaving, which helped us dress differently. 
it revolutionized our Cherokee garments because until then, our clothes were made from a combination of hides, hand wo woven cloth made from fibers and vegetable fibers, and cloth bought from traders. And we always wanted to be as self-sufficient as we could be, but we were also interested in doing things better. At that time, our men wore breech cloths and leggings, but also this weaving revolution changed our culture because up until then, the roles of our women was to do all the planting, which was traditionally the job of the women. Now, men were having to do women's jobs in order for us to pursue our weaving and making of clothes. But over the years, women, the Cherokee women, had even developed a new variety of corn known as Eastern Flint corn. So we were pretty good agrarians, but our our diet was not only just fish and meat, you know, you always hear about the great hunts of the great warriors, but we also ate a lot of vegetables. We raised beans and squash, wild onions, rice, mushrooms, greens, berries, and nuts. Mrs. Bean brought us two dairy cows from the settlement, and so she taught us to make cheese and milk, use milk, and how to use the meat from the cattle, how to eat dairy products and make them. And so it sustained our, our tribe, our village, when hunting and fishing was bad. So I became a successful cattle rancher, and I was the first to introduce that industry to our culture. That, along with weaving and dairy farming, help transform our culture and our society from a communal agricultural society into a society very similar to that of our European American neighbors. The Cherokee language differed from other of the five civilized tribes. And as you probably know, the five civilized tribes are Creek, Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Seminole. The Seminole were the smart ones because the government never moved them out of swamps. But The Cherokee language is an ancient Southern Iroquoian based language. No North American tribe had a written language. <laughs> One of our Cherokee men was a silversmith and he did beautiful work. And when the traders came through and the settlers started coming in, they wanted him to sign his work. How do, you, how do you sign something if you have no languages? So Sequoia grasped the importance of talking leaves. So he decided that he was going to create one. Now here's a man who does not know Latin, he's been to no schooling, there is nothing to go by except his mind and the great spirit. He got so involved in creating a written language that his wife became quite irritated with him because he was obsessed with his project. So she put his moccasins outside the, the dwelling. So he knew he was off the island, so to speak. <laughs> so he moved to a little cabin behind the house. The villagers thought he was communing with spirits. And he was, he was conferring with witches. So now she burned down the house, the, the cabin. <laughs> What's that quote about no wrath of broken women? It took him 12 years. He couldn't figure out, having no knowledge of any written language, he couldn't figure out whether to make pictures. or It took him 12 years, and he finally came upon creating a selfie. 
And he had a daughter that he taught the syllabary. No one was convinced that this was going to work. So they took his daughter to one place, took him to another, and had him write something. And for him to tell them what it meant. They went to the daughter and she read it. They couldn't believe it. And they're so excited that by 1835, 18% 18 of the Cherokee re could read English and 43% of the Cherokee could read Cherokee. They were much better educated than the settlers. Most of the settlers in that time and place could not read or write. The Cherokee had the first newspaper of any Indian tribe in North America. The Cherokee Phoenix and the Indian Advocate. Cherokee established schools in 1820. After the relocation to Oklahoma, we built seminaries for male and female. And if you go to Oklahoma, you can see the remains of the female <coughs> seminary. And they were the first schools west of the Mississippi River. Be so proud of your Indian heritage and your interest in, your interest in our culture. Very proud people, very resourceful people, very, very full of survival skills. When the relocation took place, the Trail of Tears was a thousand miles long. Four thousand Cherokee died on that trail. Statistically, that's a dead body every quarter of a mile. Foster Simpson Monroe, my great 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 grandson and Anita Adams's great-great-grandfather was 15 years old when he walked from Georgia to Oklahoma. No food. The people that had been contracted to feed the Indians on their field trip, their walk in the woods sponsored by the United States government, they had been given money to feed the Cherokee. They took the money and ran. Here were people that were starving. The military would not allow them any knives, guns. They couldn't hunt, they couldn't fish, they died. 4,000 people died on that walk in the woods. Today's newspaper would say something like, United States government sponsors a hike in the wood for the Indians. <laughs> Our houses were fortified towns, and they were made with wattle and daub. Wattle is lattice work, you know, held together by some form of daub which consisted of like sand and kind of a concrete type thing. Houses are still being built today all over the world with wattle and daub. Once the Cherokee got to Oklahoma, not only were they in pretty bad shape because of the weather, lack of food, nutrition, and of course there were no pictorial traces of the trail, nobody had a camera, nobody had anything to write with or on. And all of our medicines were back in Georgia, Carolinas, Tennessee. Our medicines were the roots of herbs. We used huckleberry, blackberry for gout, mint and ginger that's still used today for indigestion. 
We used wild rose for sedatives and antiseptics. We used yarrow for tea. And many others, sumac, rosemary, sage, honeysuckle, licorice root. The Cherokee belief is that health begins with the purity and well-being of one's soul or entropy. It's all about harmony and balance. On those days when we feel out of sorts, it's imperative we take the time to commune with our great spirit to restore harmony within our spirit that's been given to us by the great spirit. Great spirit is God. Our ceremonial life helped to achieve our objectives. Contrary to what's happening in our world today, there was very little sexual abuse. Because punishment for rape was to cut off an ear of the offender. So everyone would know the error of his ways. Not a bad idea. <laughs> You're not going to grow an ear back. It's not enough to say, I'm sorry, sometimes. Not that people can't be forgiven, but you can't unsee something. And once a person has been violated, there's a lack of trust, a certain amount of fear, and the Cherokee did not have that. Imagine living in a place where you knew you were safe. Even a woman by herself could go as she pleased. Then the traders came in and brought diseases. Western Europe and all through the, that part of the world, people lived with their animals. Animals have diseases. People built up an immunity to various allergens and viruses and all sorts of terrible diseases. But the American Indian, as were the Hawaiians, were very pure. The animals were animals. They were kept outside. There were a few dogs in the community, but you didn't have them in your, your dwelling. There were two major smallpox epidemics from 1690 to 1738. In just 48 years, 50% of my people died from those diseases. When Columbus arrived in 1492, there were 180 million natives, 180 million Native Americans. By the end of the 19th century, only 530,000 had survived. From 180 million, some of our Cherokee villages were completely wiped out and the people moved. Smallpox was rampant. And yes, there were a few evil people who brought the blankets that were infected with smallpox. Our Cherokee are proud people. And many of the Cherokee that survived smallpox that were so badly scarred killed themselves because they couldn't stand being so wounded and looking so terrible with all these scars all over their bodies. Measles wiped out entire villages. Whooping cough just decimated villages. The indigenous people had no defenses, no immunity. And then they also had malaria in California Indians. Many Indians died in California from malaria. From just the flu. 
from diphtherias, typhus, cholera, scarlet fever, chicken pox, yellow fever, and the common cold would wipe out entire villages, entire families. Yeah, it's true that a small percentage of people came in and brought the smallpox infested blankets. But the virus can live for a very long time, especially in cloth. So one blanket, unless it was burned, it could cause many, many deaths. The last major smallpox epidemic among the American Indian tribes was in 1921 in Pitt River, California. The Revolutionary War came along and the Battle of Kings Mountain was one of the top ten battles. And this was the first great victory for the New England Patriots. All you football fans out there. But the Revolutionary War brought many, many issues. Some of uh, some of our warriors and peoples wanted to side with the British. Some wanted to side with the settlers. Some, we were at war with each other for a while. We were arguing whether to expel the settlers or not. My cousin, the war chief Dragon Canoe, wanted to ally with the British agents against the settlers. I wanted to support the settlers. And my dear friend, Lydia, was one of the settlers. At the beginning of uh, September in 1780, the American Revolutionary General Horatio Gates had been defeated in South Carolina and by British Lieutenant General jo John Cornwallis, the British enemy. He moved his troops northwest and to the conquest of North Carolina and Virginia. This was a critical moment in the Revolutionary War. Alexander Cameron was a British agent among the Cherokee and he was an married citizen of our tribe. He had been able to sustain the alliance of the Chickamauga and Cherokee as well as some tribesmen with British interests with the Tories. The brave and resourceful pioneer soldiers, were, they didn't have fancy uniforms. They were in buckskin and homespun fabric, clothes, coonskin capped. And in a note in the history from my family, it was said that they had their own peculiar rifles for which they could shoot the head off a squirrel in the tallest tree or shoot the neck off a turkey at an incredible distance. Those muskets, any of you who are familiar with firearms, they wouldn't pass muster, to use a pun, today. The bullets were irregular. There was no standardization. But each man was so familiar with his weapon that he was proficient. So when these pioneers banded together, they held back Indians and Tories. And this battle brought the Tory resistance. So when I found out some of our people had fallen in with the plans of British Cameron, I talked to a trader, Isaac Thomas, trader. I provided him with the means of setting out to warn the back settlers of their impending danger and to get prepared for the attack on the Battle of Kings Mountain. They prepared for the attack. They destroyed Major Patrick Ferguson's crack British Loyalist troops at Kings Mountain, South Carolina on October 7, 1780. In this battle, only 90 Americans died. Compared to the British, 
1,100. Yay, patriots. This forced the British to retreat. It delayed the British advance northward and turned the tide of the Revolutionary War. I felt proud to have been an integral part of that victory. Not only was I the first woman to have voting rights in the Cherokee Indian Nation, I also had the highest powers of the tribe, even above the council. I was the head of the influential women's council that consisted of a representative from each clan. There were seven clans. The long hair, the blue, the wolf, wild potato, deer, bird, and paint. Each clan had their part of our culture. And we integrated into having a very strong village. I was named the leader of the Women's Council of Clan Representatives and became a de facto ambassador between the Cherokee and the Whites. I learned the art of diplomacy from my maternal uncle, the influential chief Atela Kula Kula, little carpenter. In 1781, when the Cherokee met with an American delegation led by John Sevier to discuss American settlements along the Little Pigeon River, I expressed surprise that no women were negotiators among the Americans. Mr. Sevier was equally appalled to think that such important work should be given to a woman. I told him, I know that women in your culture are always looked upon as nothing, but we are your mothers. You are our sons. Our cry is all for peace. Let it continue. This peace must last forever. Let your women's sons be our sons. Our sons be yours. Let your women hear our words. I heard the Americans said that my speech was very moving. I was considered an unusually sensible person, honored and loved by both white and brown people. Cherokee culture was a matrilineal society. Blood meant nothing to the Cherokee. It was all about plans. When a man married a woman, he left behind his entire clan, his entire family. He moved in to the lodge of his wife's clan. The land and everything was passed down through women. There was an equality of men and women. The men could not live without the women. The women could not live without a man. Without the men of the village doing their part, we did our part, and it worked. As I mentioned, when Sequoia's wife became angry with him, she simply had to set his moccasins outside the lodge and he knew his place had been removed. If you had no clan, you were nothing. Families and clans got along because they needed each other. Actually, setting moccasins outside the door sounds like a wonderful idea to me, but uh, that came later. In later life, I ran a, an inn, and when I got so old, 
I was no longer to attend any of the conferences. I would send a messenger with my walking stick to act in my behalf. In a biography by David Hampton, he described my death. When Jigeyu died, a light rose from her body, floated around the room like a bird, left through an open door, and disappeared towards her birthplace, Chota, in the Great Smoky Mountains. Though I now walk with the Supreme Being, my spirit lingers with the hope that each of you will discover the deeply embedded gift of spirit that has been freely given to you by the Great Spirit. I pray that in all your battles you face, especially in handling your inner battles, that you choose wisely on your path. You are only one. I am only one. But together as one, with the powers from our Great Spirit, we can be firm in our values. You have power. And so be it. Well, <laughs> I've got goosebumps and tears and all kinds of emotion going on right now. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. She gave you. I can now pronounce it. We have a little something for you. Uh, as a thank you gift from our chapter to you. Thank you. Uh, well, does anybody have any questions about that? Yes, uh, Becky. This is true, right? What you told us. Is this from your autism in the past? When I was a child, for some reason, I thought I was an Indian princess. And I mentioned it to my dad's mother who had married my grandfather, who was Cherokee. My grandfather was born and raised on um, a reservation. I've never been on a reservation. I don't consider myself Cherokee. I consider myself of Cherokee Indian heritage. So, it was no, so I mentioned it to my grandmother once, and she, Grandma was tough. <clears throat> she was a German woman. <clears throat> Wonderful woman, but if grandmother said jump, I didn't ask how high. I jumped. And I was a wild child, and she was the only person that really could corral me. But she told me, you will never mention this again. So I didn't. It was never discussed. My grandfather was obviously Indian. He had the Indian nose, like you see on my the Indian nickel. He had that beautiful bronze skin. He had straight black hair, beautiful hazel eyes, big Cherokee ears. He was obviously Cherokee. In the late 1800s, the government decided they needed to uh, civilize some of these little savages. So they took my grandfather and some of the other boys from the village, the reservation, put him in a seminary. And there's a picture somewhere of my grandfather and all these children, boys, and they looked like they had lost their last friend. I mean, they took them away from their families. Their clothes were misfitting, nobody had shoes. It's just a ragtag group of kids. But my father, my grandfather was received an education and during the settlement of the early uh, 1900s, he was awarded a farm in northeastern Oklahoma. I have been to that farm. Nothing was discussed. You didn't talk about it. In that time and place, you were better off to be a dog than to be an Indian. I still have cousins who will not talk about it. They still live back there, and I'm thinking, what more can you do to a group of people than make them so ashamed? You took all their stuff, you, you, you sent them on a march that they could hardly 
get to where they were going, and you made them so ashamed to even exist. What more can you do to a people? My cousins won't even talk about being Indian. My dad died in the early 1980s, and in his things, they found my grandfather's Indian roll number. Ta-da! I'm an Indian princess. <laughs> so my dad's youngest sister, Alvary, there's another little piece of history. My beautiful Aunt Alvary, she had that beautiful skin, like my dad, but that my, my grandfather married a very white German woman. My dad married a very white German woman. This is, this is what you get. <laughs> but my Aunt Alvary was beautiful. And she had been a captain during World War II in the WAC. Remarkable woman. She had a plaque by the side of her front door that said, if you can't find a bright side, find a dull side and polish it. Yeah. She, she's the first one that got her Indian card in my family. She went through all, jumped through the, all the hoops, and Paula and I have been talking about the, what it takes to get your Indian card. So my aunt got her Indian card, she helped me get mine, which I'm very proud and honored that I come from a people who are so resilient, so strong. So I have got my Indian card, and then, and then in my dad's thing was this, things was this handwritten account, not signed, not dated, but just on line paper, just handwritten, about all these things that I've just told you about. And I'm thinking, well, that sounds like a fairy tale, and put it away. So I was in Toastmasters in the 90s, and I had to talk about a, something to do with our country, or I forget what the topic was, and I remembered this woman, this Nancy somebody, so I got out the information. I thought, well, that'd make a nice speech. So I gave a little talk about this Indian woman. Put it away again. Then later on, it was in college, and I had a class in um, women in U.S. history. I thought, well, how exciting can that be? But I thought I can sit through anything for a semester except hold my breath. So the first night of class, the instructor informs us that we are each required for 70% of our grade to do research on a famous American woman. And she said, and I quote, you must have your subject approved by me because I do not to hear one more word about now the names just jumped out of my head. Who's the... the... No, no, no. Back in... Huh? Susan B. Anthony. I don't want to hear another word about Su Susan B. Anthony. And I almost jumped up and said, Thank God! I just don't want to hear another word about her either. And I thought, hey, there was this woman, you know, that was a famous American. At one time in America, if there had been you know, the media around, the Jigeyu was the most powerful woman in North America. So I thought, well, I'll see if she'll let me write about her, and I don't know much about her either, so I went up after class, and she got so excited, because guess what? She's part Cherokee, too! <laughs> Imagine! So she said, when you're doing your research, look for these, these, these number, um, people these names. Well, I never found any of them because her, her ancestors were smarter than mine. They hid out in the hills. They're part of that tribe, it's, you know, the Eastern Band. They never, got, they never got them out of there. The first group that left, left voluntarily. But my ancestors were determined they were going to stick it out and they were right. They had all the, the legal treaties and everything, which everyone was broken as we know. But what, what really happened, and, and what a lot of people do not realize, is that the whole biggest reason the, in, the Cherokee were relocated is because in 1820, gold was discovered on a Cherokee property. 
the next day, Georgia passed a law that no Indian could own land, own gold, mine for gold. And at that point, the Indians were, their days were numbered because they wanted, the settlers wanted their stuff. They wanted their land, they wanted them out of there. And of course, we won't discuss the, the man whose picture is on one of our monetary uh, pieces of paper, but he was a total traitor to the Indians. Did I answer your question? <laughs> that was more information than you needed to know. Oh, I got an A plus on my report. <laughs> well, it was the most original one they'd had for probably ever. I thank you again. And um, I know that everybody here enjoyed your uh, presentation immensely. I did. And... Hey.